Good evening. I'm, I'm Dan Dempsey, uh, along with Dr. Carolyn Asbury and Dr. Sankey Williams. I'm currently serving as the interim CEO here at the College of Physicians. And we're very happy to welcome you here tonight to this historic building, uh, to this historic college for, for a very historic uh, lecture, uh, the, the Schweinitz uh, lecture. Now, I'm a GI surgeon, so I don't know anything about ophthalmology, and I don't know anything about Dr. Schweinitz, so to do my homework, I spent about five minutes on Google and learned, of course, what you all know, that he was Woodrow Wilson's ophthalmologist. He was also president of the American Medical Association in 1922. He died in 1938. This is the 86th the Schweinitz uh, lecture here uh, at the College of Physicians. Uh, I want to introduce Dr. Michael Saluski, uh, the chair of our, of our section of ophthalmology here at the college, to introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for those words, Dr. Dempsey. This is a grand hall and much of the exchange of information back in the day were, was done in this kind of, of uh, place. There wasn't the internet, there wasn't uh, the number of journals, and, and therefore people came in and uh, exchanged all their ideas. And Schweinitz was very big uh, in this institution here back in the day, uh, in the early 1900s. But, I'm going to just say a couple of words about the Schweinitz before I introduce our, uh, our guest of honor tonight. So, uh, as Dan said, this is the 86th annual Schweinitz Lectureship, the oldest lectureship in America, as far as, as I know. And the first speaker was Ed Jackson, who is also, for whom the Jackson Memorial Lectureship is named after him, which is the uh, is the opening ceremony lecture at the American Academy of Ophthalmology. So, uh, Ed Jackson was a good friend of, of uh, George Schweinitz, and hence that was the first lecture given in 1938. So, um, we're happy to, to be able to continue to honor uh, Professor De Schweinitz at, at this incredible venue. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple of highlights of, uh, of De Schweinitz before he was born. He was born uh, in 1858, and he died 80 years later. He went to Moravian College in Allentown, which was a uh, of Moravian faith, which is a branch of Christianity. And the principle, their principle was that all humans uh, should be educated uh, regardless of social status or gender. De Schweinitz then went on to the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, later was appointed uh, resident physician to the University of Pennsylvania Hospital and later Children's Hospital. He practiced general medicine for four years before he devoted all of his attention to diseases of the eye. He quickly rose to the top of the field worldwide and gained international fame as an ophthalmic surgeon, teacher, and highly sought out lecturer. In 1892, he became a professor of ophthalmology at Je Jefferson Medical College. He eventually was lured back to his alma mater, becoming professor and chair of ophthalmology at the University of Pennsylvania in 1902, succeeding Professor William Norris, who held that position up to that point. During his career, De Schweinitz was elected to membership in numerous societies in his country, many of these. Uh, he was honored with posts of distinction. A small sample of these were he was president of the American Ophthalmological Society, president of the College of Physicians right here, president of the AMA, and was one of the original organizers of ARVO. These are just a few of his many positions he held while writing hundreds of articles, lecturing, and receiving numerous honorary medals and distinctions worldwide. Perhaps one of his greatest contributions during that time was this landmark textbook, which had 10 editions. This is the original edition uh, the 10th edition, uh, printed in 1924. So this is an amazing uh, uh, encyclopedia of, of uh, information. And if you page through and look at the pictures, things 
Uh, I haven't changed that much even since then. So it's, it was an amazing textbook. So and finally, as Dr. Conrad Behrens eloquently stated shortly after de Schweitz's death in 1938, in writing the history of ophthalmology in the 20th century, the work of George Edmund de Schweinitz will stand out with that of other great men like Wilmer and Fuchs. It is certain that the inspiration from his work and character will continue to be a force driving ophthalmology to ever greater heights. Karen, Conrad Behrens, a famous ophthalmologist in his own right, gave the de Schweinitz lecture in 1954. And if you look on your program, you will see all of the uh, all of the former speakers, and there's quite a uh, who's who list in there. Uh, several of our former Schweinitz lecturers are here with us tonight, and uh, you will be able to uh, look through there and, and match up who some of them are. And thanks for coming. And now on to our honored guest, Professor Donald L. Butens, received his college diploma at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where he majored in psychology. He then departed, went to Boston to attend Harvard Medical School. He then came back to Philadelphia for residency in ophthalmology at Shea. He then went on to do a glaucoma fellowship at Baskin Palmer and was a HE fellowship awardee while there. He returned back to Shea to become chief resident for a year where I got to see firsthand how great of a surgeon he was and even a better person. He stayed on his shape for a little more than another year, and as much as we wanted him to stay, he was lured back to Baskin Palmer, where he rose to prominence internationally while a member of the glaucoma faculty for 17 years. In 2004, he received a master's in public health at the Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore. He then took over as the Kittner Distinguished Professor and Chairman of Ophthalmology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He is currently President of the AEPO, Association of University Professors in Ophthalmology, and past President of the American Glaucoma Society. Dr. Boudens is an editorial reviewer at numerous medical journals, is an Associate Editor of the American Journal of Ophthalmology and the Journal of Glaucoma, and serves as the Editor-in-Chief of the Glaucoma Issue of Current Opinion in Ophthalmology. He's been Principal of Investigator on numerous major glaucoma clinical trials, including uh, OATS, TBT, and the ABC studies. Dr. Budenz has pu published wildly, uh, widely in the field of, of glaucoma. He's authored two textbooks, one on the Atlas of Visual Fields and the other Atlas of OCT for glaucoma has contributed numerous chapters to other books and written and co-authored co over 250 peer-reviewed journal articles. He has received Humanitarian of the Year awards from the American Glaucoma Society and the American Academy of Ophthalmology for his work in Ghana. So it is a privilege and honor to welcome back Professor Donald Budenz, who will deliver the 86th George E. DeSchwinas Memorial Lecture. So much. It's great to be back with friends. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I, I am, like Dr. Schwanitz, a uh, Philadelphian. Um, I was born at Roxborough Hospital and grew up in East Falls, about five miles north of here. Um, I was the first in my family to graduate from college, and I never dreamed that I'd be speaking at the college positions as a doctor someday. Um, so this is a an emotional homecoming for me, uh, but mostly it's great to be with old friends, a lot of whom I have to thank for my career. You know, Dr. Steve Orlin and, and the late David Kozar for teaching me cataract surgery and everything about the anterior segment, Dr. Sandy Brucker, who really launched my academic career, uh, recommending me for the Atlas of Visual Fields project, which, which you know, really helped me tremendously. And uh, Al McGuire and Gene Bennett, who launched my basic research career in gene therapy, I now have the pleasure of leading a gene therapy group that I put together at University of North Carolina, and they've, they've been very helpful in that regard. And so, uh, you know, it's very, very gratifying to uh, come and speak among friends and, and mentors, and uh, I wish you all well. Thanks for having me. The topic of tonight's uh, talk is glaucoma at the center of the earth. I don't have any relevant financial disclosures. There has been um, 
some support for this study listed here. But I was asked to say a few words about Dr. Deschweinitz um, and uh, learning a lot about him um, uh, as part of this lecture, having known uh, about him, his name anyway, as a resident and junior faculty at Shea. Um, he is a, a Philadelphian who graduated from Arabian College um, and uh, University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. As Mike said, he was the second chair of the Department of Ophthalmology. And I, I have a copy of Dr. Uh, Shea's biography. And Dr. Shea in that biography said that Dr. Schweinitz was a very austere, dignified, sophisticated gentleman, an excellent speaker, and someone who stood for everything that was good in medicine. He did leave a $300,000 endowment upon his death. Uh, and I believe that uh, the Dow chair for the chairman of the department is named Norris and uh, Deschweinitz. There's probably a story about why both of those names, but uh, Mike can tell that next time. How's that? As Mike said, he served as president of many of our uh, national and international societies. Incredible that an ophthalmologist was president of the AMA in 1922. I don't think there's any chance of that happening in this century. Uh, um, and these are just a list of some of the awards that he received, most notably the, the Howe Medal uh, from the American Ophthalmological Society, which George State has received. I remember being there for that from George, and uh, also Jerry Shields just recently. So many Philadelphians have been represented at the AOS. And uh, actually, Mike uh, talked about the textbook, Diseases of the Eye, and the amazing thing about this was it, it was it re in reprints uh, five times and had 10 editions, unlike my two books that have never been reprinted and only have one edition. So, you know, he's far outpaced me like exponentially with this landmark book. Um, uh, and uh, I did want to tell a, a neat story that I found in uh, Dr. Shea's uh, memoirs. Apparently, Woodrow Wilson, before he became president, had sudden vision loss in one eye and he came up to Philadelphia to see Dr. Schweinitz and from what I read, it sounded like it was a central retinal vein occlusion or some kind of vascular occlusion. And uh, being a great physician, not just ophthalmologist, he took the blood pressure and identified elevated blood pressure. And uh, the quote is that Dr. Deschweinitz bluntly advised the patient to give up active work. And that was seven years before he became president. So fortunately, Woodrow Wilson did not take that advice. Um, most of my patients don't take my advice. But, um, so um, just to uh, uh, talk a little bit about the um, research that I've been doing in Ghana over the past, um, uh, I guess, almost 20 years. I've been going to Ghana as a volunteer surgeon since 1995. And uh, after I got my MPH at, at uh, the Bloomberg School, I realized that really there had not been an eye survey or, or glaucoma survey in West Africa like there had been in East Baltimore and other parts of the world. So I foolishly thought that I could put the funding and people together to do one myself, um, and uh, was able to do it with the help of all these um, collaborators all over the world. And the reason why we did it is that um, there weren't any real um, comprehensive eye disease surveys in Africa, and certainly none that were focusing on glaucoma, mostly focused on trachoma and onchocerciasis. And um, you know, just to inform the Ministry of Health what was really going on with chronic eye disease in an aging population, uh, this seemed like a good uh, idea. And what we did hypothesize that uh, West African populations have the highest prevalence of glaucoma in the world. And so um, I've, I've been working in, in Ghana on the west coast of Africa for you know, probably eight or nine years when we uh, started this study. And uh, basically, Ghana was the first sub-Saharan country to break away from colonial rule, uh, which they're very, very proud of in 1957, and uh, surrounded by Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, and Togo. And um, we chose Tema, um, this town about 45 minutes east of Accra, the capital, because it was a major industrial center. Um, that was referred to as the melting pot of Ghana. And we wanted to try to get a representative sample of all the tribal groups in Ghana. Uh, and this uh, is a place where we, we thought we could do that um, because almost 60% of uh, the people living there were from other areas of Ghana. 
um, ease of transportation for the teams that came in and out uh, listed on the previous slide um, because Accra is a major uh, airport in the West African region. And this clinic, uh, which uh, was affiliated with the other clinics I had worked with in the area, um, were experienced with ophthalmic photography, which was pretty unique. And actually, Tema is uh, really at the center of the earth. If you look at the city and where it lies, it's right on the Greenwich Meridian, and the equator runs just to the south of it. So it's about as close as you can get to the center of the earth. And so um, this seemed like another good reason to do this study there. So we determined the prevalence of uh, blindness and visual impairment disability uh, and focused on glaucoma as well as other diseases in this urban West African adult population. And we uh, did some ancillary studies on the way that I don't have time to talk about. But it was very interesting, you know, as I tried to apply what I learned at uh, Hopkins to this research, uh, um, West Africa was undergoing a, a dramatic demographic transition from a high birth rate and early death rate due to infectious disease to a lower birth rate due to family planning and an increasingly aging population, uh, which lead to increased diseases of aging, and in the eye that would be cataract and glaucoma. And so what that sort of looks like is a lengthening life expectancy of birth life expectancy in 2000 was 58 years, 75 years in 2050. And instead of the classic pyramid with lots and lots of young folks and very few people making it to older age, um, with improvements in public health and health care and family planning, there has been a dramatic change in Ghana's uh, population pyramid. And so the other interesting change that was going on demographically was a change from an agrarian farming society to an urban society. Uh, and there were 23% urbanites in 1960 compared to 48% in, in uh, 2009. So there had been a sort of a concentration of folks in urban centers. And so we um, determined to study people age 40 and over, uh, first because the prevalence of I problems, as we all know, is low under the age of 40, and we would have needed over 11,000 subjects to study eye diseases at all ages. Um, and uh, glaucoma starts at a younger age in people of African descent, so um, we didn't want to start any older than 40. And in fact, this is the age that the Baltimore Eye Survey studied. Um, and my mentors at Hopkins, who helped me design the study, uh, recommended. And uh, the first study looked at the prevalence of um, glaucoma in this population. Uh, and just to remind you, the prevalence is sort of a snapshot of what percentage of the population has a particular disease at this point in time. Whereas incidence, the second study is, what percentage of the population is developing the disease per year over time? And so uh, those are the two separate studies that I'll be talking about. Um, it's incredibly difficult to get a random sampling of people, though. Uh, 5,600 people is how many we needed. Um, and so uh, with the help of Jim Tilsch, um, we decided on a random cluster sampling where we uh, drew clusters of people in little neighborhoods using voting rolls, estimating how many would be in each of these clusters. We actually needed about 36 clusters in these five neighborhoods within Tema. And, uh, these are the five neighborhoods. This is the original map that we used to kind of find these five communities. And uh, we, we met, had to map these communities physically, and sort of drawing boundaries using streets. We actually did our own census because um, all we had was sort of voting roles. So we went house to house in these uh, clusters and uh, invited everyone over the age of 40 to a field examination set up at a local school or church, and then anyone who failed that examination, we uh, transported back to the clinic at a future date. And uh, this is just an example of how you know, tedious it was to map these communities who were literally going from house to house. Um, this is Hannah Kim, who you'll meet later, uh, and uh, Monica Chalk, uh, with uh, local, usually a polling official that knew these boundaries well um, to help us uh, set the boundaries and go house to house to do a census. 
And um, this is typical West African housing where you can literally reach your arms out and touch people's homes uh, on each side. And uh, some of the mapping was easy with you know standard uh, squares of uh, streets and alleys uh, that we had to sort of name uh, because they didn't have any names. And others were a little bit crazier, but um, we invited people back uh, as we census them to the upcoming field examination, and people were uh, very responsive and eager to have their eyes examined. We asked them to bring their glasses with them, and we did visual acuity with best correction, and then we did auto refraction and recheck their vision uh, in the field. We did uh, pressures and we did uh, FTT uh, perimetry. Uh, we dilated folks and uh, did digital uh, 2D uh, photographs of the macula and the disc. And then if anyone uh, had a vision 2040 or worse in their better eye, then they were referred back. We referred back people who had um, high pressures and uh, if they failed FDT two times in a row, if they had narrow angles, as judged by an ophthalmic nurse who was with us. And uh, we did send the disc photos to the Moorefields Reading Center and then uh, call people back if they had a large up to disc ratio. And so the field exam is also tedious. Uh, here we are loading a van up that we purchased with a, a tumbling knee chart, and then uh, had one of the technicians doing vision with a tumbling knee because of the high illiteracy rate. And this was a um, special ETERS tumbling knee chart developed by Rupert Bourne from the UK that we, that we purchased and that had been validated. We had two FDT machines uh, which was sort of a rate limiting step, just like opening visual fields in your office. So we had two of them running at all times with two uh, technicians and tono pen and tracker pressures in the field, central corneal thickness using the same instrument as the OATS study, and uh, digital photos with the first Kawa, anyway, handheld digital camera. Uh, we started the study in 2006. And we got one of the actual very first ones off of the production line. Um, and so the timing was really good for that. Um, and then uh, we referred people to clinic uh, for these criteria. As I said, at 0 0.7 is, is two standard deviations above the mean for this population. So that's why we chose that cutoff. And then in the clinic, we did a typical full glaucoma workup. Um, but included uh, an optometry visit to get their best corrected visual acuity because didn't trust the auto refractor and did full examination with uh, gonioscopy, formal Humphrey visual fields, um, dilation, and then uh, disc and macular photos with the NIDAC 2DX, which is a 3D camera. Uh, and those were also sent to more fields for reading. And so here's a technician from the US training on the Humphrey visual field and uh, Keith Bart and my collaborators doing the glaucoma exam. And we would have these teams go in uh, quarterly to examine the patients that had failed the uh, screening field exams. Um, and Hannah Kim, a medical student at the time, took a year off from Stanford. She's now a glaucoma specialist in uh, the LA area and is in Ghana right now doing glaucoma surgery and teaching. Um, and so everything was digital uh, and we were able to send in JPEGs in the visual fields and Julia Whiteside to read them and all the photos went to the Moorefields Reading Center. And then we managed all the data um, on a SharePoint website. This is again 2006. And so we censused uh, 6,800 people, did field of examinations of 5,600. So we had a response rate of 82% of people that were invited back. And then 1869 failed the field exam and we did clinic exams on 82% of them. And we did end up with a, with a nice uh, representation of the Ghanaian population. We were working in the greater Accra region, uh, and only 30% of our population was from Accra, and the other 70% were from other regions within the country. Um, so I thought that was a pretty good representative sample. Of course, we could have sampled the whole country, but that would have been extraordinarily expensive and, and uh, logistically very difficult, and we really running this on a shoestring of, of uh, grants from various sources. Um, and so uh, just to say a word about visual acuity, 18% of people 
had failed visual acuity, but when uh, glasses were tried, when refraction was done, that number got down to 7.4%. So 7.4% was sort of unexplained by refractive error. And so these are the etiologies of the unexplained vision loss, cataract and glaucoma, as you might suspect, corneal opacification, uh, difficult to get more specific than that, uh, Stephen Mike, just because um, you know we didn't know the history of why the cornea was opacified. Opacified could have been could have been trachoma or things like that, but uh, uh, it wasn't our focus. Retinal disease, uh, seven percent, and then non-glaucoma optic neuropathies, about two point four percent. So I mean, really, the talk is about glaucoma, and, and you know, as a glaucoma specialist, I was really interested in that question. And so um, Al Silmer, who was also one of my mentors, he was the dean of the School of Public Health at, at the time, wrote a nice editorial about proper glaucoma uh, surveys, and these should be randomly sampled, population-based, and case definitions that don't include elevated IOP. And to date, there were really only three of these that have been performed in uh, Africa, one in East Africa, and two in South Africa. And so ours was a fourth of those. Um, and uh, we knew that um, glaucoma disproportionately affects people of Af African descent, that there's an increase in prevalence as well as a younger age of onset and a more severe course. And But all of these findings had been based on studies um, performed outside of Africa, primarily the East Baltimore, Barbados, and St. Lucia studies. And interestingly, the studies in the East and Southern Africa showed a lower prevalence of open angle glaucoma than the North American studies, the Caribbean studies that we uh, had for comparison. So this was all our, very interesting. We used a definition of glaucoma that was uh, proposed by the uh, Hopkins group um, that we'll talk about in a little bit. So um, category one are uh, subjects who had visual field and optic disc changes consistent with glaucoma. In our sample um, of 5,600, there are 316 of them at about 5.6%. Category one are just people that I think everyone in the room would agree on. This is definitely glaucoma because we had formal monthly visual fields and an optic disc uh, abnormality match. Category two are patients who had advanced disc damage, but we couldn't obtain a visual field, so perhaps someone with a 0.9 disc or something that were clearly glaucomatous, but we could not get a, a visual field. And then category three was someone who was blind with an IOP over 35, but the disc wasn't visible, maybe an opacified cornea or other reason, and visual field was impossible. Not, not very many in those groups, so we're, we're pretty certain about those numbers, and that was according to the Foster uh, definition from Hopkins. And the types of glaucoma that we found, primarily primary open angle glaucoma, we did gonioscopy on every single patient that presented, and all of our investigators were trained glaucoma specialists. Um, and uh, chronic narrow angle glaucoma was, was very low, uh, a few with traumatic and a few with other uh, in this population anyway. And um, we basically sort of tried to get numbers that we could compare to other glaucoma surveys um, by normalizing to age and gender in other populations. And the overall prevalence of glaucoma was 6.8%. Uh, when we did that, and um, just basically then uh, comparing to other studies, the adjusted prevalence in our population was about 8%, which was very similar to the St. Lucia and Barbados studies, in fact, halfway in between. And uh, that um, made a lot of sense to us because uh, in the Caribbean, there isn't a lot of admixture, genetically speaking, and in our population, of course, has little to no admixture. Whereas um, the Baltimore Eye Study and the studies done in the U.S. and people of African descent have a lot of admixture and a lower prevalence of glaucoma. And interestingly, similarly, in East and Southern Africa, a lower prevalence of glaucoma. And this is all of that shown graphically. So, you know, sort of the Caribbean, two Caribbean studies in our study uh, showing about an 8% prevalence, the uh, highest in the world. And so, uh, sort of proved our hypothesis and if we compare those high rates to other ethnicities, of course, um, showing that, that we have a much higher uh, prevalence in people of African descent, uh, particularly in the 
uh, African and Caribbean groups. Um, and uh, this is just the distribution of intraocular pressures in the folks identified with glaucoma, uh, showing that there is normal tension glaucoma in this group, and you know, just proving that IOP isn't the best way to screen for glaucoma in this population either. But it certainly was a risk factor for the disease. Uh, unfortunately, we found that only 3% of these folks who we identified with glaucoma knew that they had it at the time. If you recall from the Baltimore Eye Survey, about 50% of the people identified with glaucoma did not know they had glaucoma at the time. And so uh, ours was more like 97% of people. And of course, that's a healthcare access issue and um, um, a sort of developed versus underdeveloped country issue. Um, and then uh, to finish off, we basically looked at 1,200 previously normal subjects from the first survey, eight to nine years later, and we brought them back all for a clinic examination to look for glaucoma, so a full clinic examination, and basically did the same testing with the same instruments that were still there and working eight years later. That team is shown here, um, some overlap between the uh, two teams, but a smaller team, not as many patients to see, but seen in the same way. And, and you know, basically we, we did find the incidence of glaucoma of about 4.7% over the eight years. And when you do that um, and compare that to other studies, you need to sort of annualize that. The um, rates are highest in this uh, West African group, um, and the uh, Barbados eye study did have a follow-up incident study. St. Lucia, unfortunately, did not. Um, so um, we just sort of um, tied those groups together, of course, in the incidents as well. We did some ancillary studies that um, along the way, but it's you know, probably not a lot to look at, although uh, this was at the time the largest source of ocular uh, genetic material uh, that I collaborated on with the folks at Duke, Mike Hauser and Rand Allingham, uh, on looking for genes in African populations. Um, and uh, these have been added to larger and larger uh, pools of data from around the world people from Africa descent. So um, you know, basically, we learned a lot more in this study. Uh, one is that we confirmed that primary medical glaucoma is most prevalent in people of West African descent. We found in our ancillary studies that central corneal thickness measurements are, are thicker with ultrasound than with OCT. Um, we had uh, new anterior segment OCT at the time, and nobody had looked at that, so we did both uh, on a group of patients. We also did a longitudinal study and the 1,200 patients that came back and saw, of course, the central corneal thickness decreases with age, but the rate was faster in patients with open adipo glaucoma than the normal group in that uh, follow-up study. And um, uh, one interesting, you know, very practical uh, study that we did is that um, we compared what our actual investigators got uh, in measuring cup to this ratio at the slit lamp with a 90 diopter lens and recorded compared to what those same investigators were recording when given the actual uh, stereo disc pairs to look at. And um, so uh, basically there was a systematic error or difference in uh, the two uh, measurements depending on the size of the, uh, the cub. And so um, if you're in your clinic and comparing what you see to baseline photographs, which I had sort of done for years and not getting follow-up photographs. If you think there's a change, get photographs and compare photograph to photograph, ideally in a masked fashion like the old study did. And uh, that would be a better way to determine whether uh, someone's disc has actually um, progressed in glaucoma. And so to, lastly, I'd like to just finish about the you know, resource problem that we have internationally. This is just a map showing the density of ophthalmologists worldwide in different countries, darker density means more ophthalmologists per population. And these lighter areas, of course, are you know, quite desperate in terms of not having ophthalmologists. I think this is improving with training efforts in Sub-Saharan Africa, but certainly not fast enough. Um, and so in Ghana, for instance, there's approximately 53 ophthalmologists for 27 million people, or one for every 500,000, whereas we have one 
for every 10,000 inhabitants, probably in Philadelphia, it feels like one for every 100 inhabitants sometimes, it's a very competitive market. Um, and interestingly, half the world's ophthalmologists live in China, US, India, Russia, Japan, and Brazil, and the other half live elsewhere. So I think like, like urban and rural US, there's, there's enough ophthalmologists, but just maldistributed, and worldwide that's true as well. So anything we can do to improve that, I think will help. This is just a, a slide showing that in a different way. And for instance, in Ghana, there are two ophthalmologists per million people. The, the Congo, uh, you know, one per million people. Whereas, you know, in Australia, there's 40 per million people, and we have 50 per million people. So, um, you know, just a, a difference in, in, uh, in the density. And then um, next, you know, we would like to improve um, uh, case detection in Ghana. Uh, to find that 97% through screening methods and looking at portable screening, internet-based screening, photographs at pharmacies and DMV offices, all these things we're um, working uh, on with investigators around the world. And um, certainly finding better treatments uh, than medications and, and current surgery. Um, you know, that's a real struggle in another lecture entirely about what to do once you find glaucoma in this setting. And then uh, we're actively engaged in training eye care professionals to diagnose and manage glaucoma. And uh, uh, that's, you know, part of the things that we do over there. And I sort of manage a team of glaucoma specialists from the U.S. and U.K. Um, that go quarterly now to the same clinic to uh, train ophthalmologists and do glaucoma surgery uh, and uh, hopefully make a difference in that part of the world, uh, you know, establishing a glaucoma center of excellence where docs around the country can, can refer their patients and come and, and learn. Um, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to the magnitude of the problem. I know Dr. Spade has been involved in um, uh, trying to equip African ophthalmologists to take better care of glaucoma, but uh, it's, it's a huge growing problem and we just need a lot of people helping. So thanks very much for inviting me and appreciate your coming to the lecture tonight. That was amazing, Don. Just incredible work. Congratulations. Does anyone have any questions for uh, Dr. Boudin's? Uh, I saw where you did a it looked like there was a small but significant portion of people who had narrow angle glaucoma. How many PIs were done, and was that in an older population with bigger, you know, nuclear, nuclear sclerosis, bigger lens that was causing that? What, what was that group like? It was a small group, you're right, about, about 3%. At the time, we did have a, a functioning laser and did laser those people. Um, and, and it is something that we actively you know, look for, you know, and try to train the Ghanaians who have not, you know, the Ghanaian ophthalmologists have not had teaching in, in gonioscopy. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's something that I saw here as a resident in Philadelphia, sort of the creeping ankle closure glaucoma. And um, I, I do think, you know, LPI is the right, right thing to do. I, I, I can tell you stories about having lasers and then getting, you know, fried by changes in, in voltage, and, and so we, we learned the hard way to shut the electricity down and use the generator that we bought for the study to run the laser because otherwise the power fluctuates. We actually do the same thing. <laughs> yes, yes. And so you know, and, and now we use like voltage stabilizers, which are like super surge protectors to keep all this fancy equipment from burning out and. We don't have a laser there now. I'm, I'm hoping we get the portable, like a portable SLT, you know, yeah, except the laser. But yes, um, you know, small percentage of angle closure, that, which means we have to keep doing gonioscopy in that setting. And if you're not using medication for the open angle glaucoma, what's your, what's your thought? I'm st still using medications for open angle glaucoma. Unfortunately, it really takes a lot of education to have the patients take it lifelong because their exposure to medicines their whole life has been sort of an infectious disease. 
model where you, you know, finish the pills after two weeks and you don't take them anymore because you're cured. And so, and I think we certainly see this in our clinic sometime. And so the educational component is huge. And they can get medications affordably there. That doesn't seem to be the problem. And they have everything that we have here. Um, it's just compliance, which, you know, is a problem here as well. And in terms of surgery, our algorithm is to do trabeculectomy with mitomycin, if and when that fails, a glaucoma drainage implant, and then uh, cyclophotocoagulation, which we just introduced um, about a year ago. Um, I got one donated from Iris Medical, you know, probes and things, and we have all our volunteers safe for the probes. Um, and then talk the, the clinic ophthalmologist to do that. You know, obviously it's super easy for them to do that, but only after they've failed a uh, glaucoma tube shunt surgery. And even that's been challenging because the glaucoma gurus in the room will say that, you know, the Almed implant, which is the easiest one to implant, often becomes encapsulated and the pressure is still too high afterwards, and you have to do something else. And doing, you know, a, a 350 or even a 250 bar valve in this setting is difficult, and you, know, you have to tie off the tube and when it dissolves, there might not be a glaucoma specialist there to manage the complications or the complications of ophthalmologists. And so that, that in and of itself is a challenge, trying to figure out what the best surgery is there. But it's still for us, you know, mitomycin 0.4 milligrams per, per cc for two to four minutes, that seems to be the best surgery. And I, I see patients that I operated on 10 years ago that are doing great, just, just like the patients here in the US. It does take a lot of anti-metabolites, and then you have to take the cataract out, you know, and, and then it fails anyway. So um, just, just, you know, struggle after struggle, but uh, not, nothing different than uh, Dr. Spaeth and colleagues have dealt with all these years in Philadelphia. So. You done? Um, back here. Joel. Hey, Joel. Um, yeah. Do you have a number of people who develop a home who have uh, normal exams uh, previously when you went back with the lipid? Um, and I'm wondering, you know, you had this great reading center right, at Moorfield. If you look back at the disc photos in those patients, um, would they have been considered suspicious or pre-parametric glaucoma um, at, at the baseline exam and then converting to glaucoma? Yeah, we, we didn't really didn't really look at that, um, but certainly it's something that we could do, you know, because it's not a you have too large of a group, so I think that's a good idea. Don, I'm, I'm curious about your comments about setting up a, uh, cameras in pharmacies, places like that. We're, we're trying to do similar things here in Philadelphia. Um, can you comment more on sort of screening for disease using photography or other methods? Yes, um, so, um, we have a collaborator in, uh, in Ireland who uh, would like to basically take pictures of people's optic nerves in Ghana um, as sort of a trial uh, when they get their driver's license. Um, and then, you know, they, they would actually carry that with them, you know, on a USB drive and, uh, you know, for when it's needed. And don't we all wish we had that on our patients to say whether they had developed glaucoma, you know, pre-parametric glaucoma. Um, and so uh, that, that's one study uh, that's being done. And then in North Carolina with uh, Emily Gower, who many of you may know, PhD epidemiologist who trained at Hopkins and is now, uh, I recruited from Wake Forest, is, is looking at putting um, cameras in retail pharmacies uh, for diabetic patients uh, to get pictures taken when they you know, get their medications filled. And so she's doing some work in that area. And certainly, um, there's a lot of interest in taking disc photos at the same time when we screen for diabetic retinopathy. Because I think maybe an astute, you know, examiner or maybe AI could identify discs at risk um, and, and try to get people in for glaucoma as well. So I do think we need to do a better job here in diabetic retinopathy, especially in North Carolina, and a uh, better job in glaucoma in Africa. So. Well, thanks again. Great to see you.
you did the great Deschmines lectureship is a commemorative uh, Philadelphia bowl with the uh, date and your name and lectureship for you to keep on your mantle. Looks great, thank you. So, uh, congratulations.